stacks of rusting automobiles, mountains of man-made debris, where tons of refuse come to be torched, wrecked, and shredded. But what seems like the end of the road is really a new lease on life. Now, Junkyards on Modern Marvels. Junkyards, scrapyards, boneyards, call them what you will. They conjure nightmarish images of snarling dogs. And they're always located on the wrong side of the tracks. But the name is misleading. They are homes to almost everything that is aged, smashed, or just doesn't work anymore. But unlike garbage, everything in the junkyard has value, either as secondhand goods or as recyclable material. We could call this a resource yard. We could call this an environmental yard, different from anything you'll ever see anyplace else, and something that is a key component to American society and the American economy. Go to a junkyard. Just take a slow look around. Because you're not looking at junk. You're looking at money. Money by the ton. Just as currency comes in all shapes and sizes, so do junkyards and the material in them. The metal scrapyard is just one type of junkyard. Anything made of metal, from industrial equipment to household appliances, is accepted. Eventually, everything here will be sold to metal manufacturers for recycling. Steel from demolished buildings, railroad tracks, and crushed automobiles seem to chaotically litter these yards. But everything here has a price, purpose, and place. The trucks are coming in, basically, they come in and they dump at different areas in the yard, depending on the commodity of the uh, material. With each truck bringing nearly 80,000 pounds of metal, the scrapyard can run out of space fast. For workers, compressing and compacting the huge piles of debris is a major part of the job. The mill is the tool of choice for light gauge metal. The adage, separation is painful, has never been truer. The mill at the Hugo New Proler scrapyard in Long Beach, California, has been operating for nearly 40 years. Old cars make up a majority of its diet. Multiple conveyor belts move the metal into and out of the machine. Inside this tower lies the heart of the contraption, the grinder. An enormous drum, bristling with 24 swivel hammers, spins at almost 450 revolutions per minute, pulverizing everything it touches. Grinding takes its toll on the mill, and the hammers must be periodically replaced. Workers remove the housing and move into the belly of the beast. With safety locks in place, the men carefully detach the old hammers. The new hammers, weighing nearly 400 pounds each, are lowered in by crane and secured. With the mill back in action, pounded debris streams from the grinding chamber. It goes across a sequence of magnets and through a blower, which sucks off all of the non-metallics, along with the carpet, uh, the star foam, and that goes into another direction. A conveyor belt deposits the scrap back into the yard. Because of their mill, Hugo New Proler boasts one of the largest parking lots in the world. Only to find your car, you'll need to bring a shovel. But some of the metal that enters the scrapyard is even too tough for the mill. Any material over a quarter inch thick is sent to the 2,000 ton shearer.
Up to six tons of scrap is loaded into the shearer by a grappling claw crane. Hydraulic compactors bend and fold the metal until it's shaped like a loaf of bread. A 32-foot long gather cylinder pushes the scrap towards the blades. The giant shears chew through the emerging scrap. The cutting surface is actually five blades, three above and two on the bottom. Each is 34 inches long and nearly five inches thick. The scrapyard is a processing plant, and the metal doesn't stay long. Most of the material leaves the Hugo New Proler Yard on ocean-going scrap ships. This ship, bound for a Korean steel mill, is over 600 feet in length, and loaded with nearly 30,000 tons. Most people's junk is another person's gold, you know, it's a gold mine. We don't look at it as junk, we look at it as scrap, and it's worth something to everybody. And that has always been true. Recycling and reusing things is nothing new. For early humans, gathering raw materials was extremely difficult. Miners in 4500 BC struggled to collect copper in the mountains of what is today Serbia. They managed to dig multiple shafts, some up to 60 feet deep, using picks made from deer antlers. With commodities acquired at such a high price, early humans were very frugal, finding it easier to reuse something than to create it anew. I think honestly that human beings recycled as soon as they made the first artifact. They always focused on ways to use something in as many ways as possible, and then if it broke, to figure out another way they could use it. Early craftsmen took recycling one step further by reusing pieces from abandoned structures to create new buildings. Pieces from some of the greatest monuments of the ancient world found their way into new creations. In the 1500s, Spanish conquistadors in Mexico destroyed Aztec buildings to construct their own cities. Centuries before, parts of the Roman Colosseum morphed into St. Peter's Basilica. Even the mighty Colossus of Rhodes was scrapped by invaders to make tools and weapons. Part of the reason that metal was so important to these people was it took a tremendous amount of skill and energy to forge it into the original implement, whether it was a helmet or a sword or chain mail or whatever else. Weapons such as swords and spears could ensure a king's authority and were prized by early royalty and scrap collectors alike. Archaeologists that dig up battlefields are really frustrated people because originally years ago we thought that when you dig up a battlefield you're going to find uh, helmets and swords and chain mail and all this kind of stuff. Uh-uh. On one such battlefield the fate of England was decided. In 1066, 7,000 Norman troops invaded Britain under the command of William I. The English king, Harold II, raised an army of 7,000 to repulse the attack. The two forces met on the battlefield of Hastings. When the fighting had ended, nearly 3,500 men lay dead, including the English king, clearing the way for William to become England's first Norman monarch. In 1966, the British archaeologists decided that they would dig up the battlefield because they had all these reports. They knew where the battlefield was, they knew where the archers were, and the longbowmen were, and the spearmen were, and the sword fighters were, and all this, and they were going to recreate the battle in the archaeological remains. And all they got were some teeth and bones and very little else. The metal is gone. And the reason it's gone is the dead soldiers were picked clean for any valuables, especially metal. The dead weren't the only ones plundered for scrap metal. When the pirate Captain Kidd was captured in 1699, 
Included in his treasure was 10 tons of scrap iron. But the Industrial Revolution and cheap mass-produced steel removed metal from the most wanted list. With the Industrial Revolution, there were a lot of scrap yards, but the real focus for the scrap dealers was rags. And the important thing was the value of those rags in making paper to the point where a ton of rags, for most of the time from the 1600s all the way up to the 1900s, was as valuable relatively as a ton of aluminum is today. It was really where the money was. But Western Railroad expansion in the 1800s changed the rag business forever. With new access to a seemingly endless forest at hand, companies learned to mass produce paper from lumber. The vagrant rag pickers were out of a job. The ones that chose to stay in the junk business were forced to shift their focus. Metal, wagon parts, and building materials became the lifeblood for the junk industry. The goods collected were resold as secondhand, or broken down to be recycled. The 19th century image of the junk man in his horse-drawn wagon became an enduring, albeit low-class symbol of American society. My mother right now is 100 years old, almost 101, and she always told the story about the Shine Brothers from Spencer. Uh, they came around on the farm every spring and they would ask if we had any old pots and pans and they would trade it for a broom and they came around with a horse and buggy to pick up this stuff. But the often maligned junkyard and junk industry managed to gain popularity during the First and Second World Wars. Scrap metal from the yards helped feed the war machine. With World War II, metal took on an even more important strategic role. And the government began to pack rat everything. And it was scrap dealers, scrap paper, scrap metal, who were part of the core of this and who were really seeing to it that our war effort had a metal backbone. Despite their wartime triumph, junkyards rarely received the respect they deserved. During the 1960s, Lady Bird Johnson crusaded to keep America beautiful. The humble junkyard was one of her first targets. Lawmakers passed ordinances prohibiting yards to exist within eyesight of major highways. Many junkyards were forced to build large perimeter walls, not to keep out intruders, but to keep from being seen. Today, these one-time eyesores are getting a second look. Evolving thoughts about the economy and ecology have changed the junkyard's image. And what was once considered second-hand garbage is now seen as pure gold. Next, America's love of the automobile puts junkyards in every city. Considered England's first great poet, the 14th century writer Geoffrey Chaucer was employed by the king to keep track of the country's scrap metal. Junkyards will return on Modern Marvels. The End of the Road. Since the first cars rolled off Henry Ford's assembly line, Americans have loved their automobiles. But when love dies, it ends up here. The Automobile Salvage Yard. In the U.S., nearly 11 million cars are retired each year. Enough to fill a four-lane highway from New York to Los Angeles. Yet it's rare to see even one vehicle abandoned on the side of the road. That's because every car has life left in it, if you know where to look. You would really be surprised at the level of expertise in a place like this, in a junkyard. And these are people that can divide hubcaps into 150 or 200 types, know exactly where they are, know exactly how to clean them up, get them out, put them on your car, and get you out of there. By reselling used parts, automobile salvage yards have perfected ways of squeezing every last mile out of an automobile. They are modern-day assembly lines, in reverse. 
In a traditional auto wrecking yard, workers dismantle and meticulously catalog every piece. Body panels are stacked, engines pulled, and electronics are gutted from the wrecked heap. The goal is to remove everything that can be resold. And this has been going on for nearly as long as there have been cars on the road. A gentleman named Johnny Carter down in Houston claims to be the first automotive dismantler in the United States. Uh, they started somewhere in the 1910, 1915 era, as I recall. Generally, it started on the edge of every city, on the cheaper ground, where people would get a hold of abandoned cars and start selling some parts off them. Early entrepreneurs had to devise creative ways to separate the car from its worthwhile parts. When we first got into the automobile uh, salvage business, uh, the automobiles as they came in, we would get a little gas out of the tank, put a match in, we'd burn them up. We burned them because this got rid of all of the perishable things, the upholstery, the wood, because most of the cars were half wood and the other half was steel. Early tools of the trade were only slightly more advanced than fire. We got our first cutting torch in about 1940. I was just a kid, but I remember when they came, they were demonstrating it, how to use it. Uh, prior to that, we used cold cut and hammer and sledge. And I think that's where the name auto wrecker probably came into being because we were wrecking them with chisels and hammers. Then the first cutting torch came in, then we could start cutting the cars up into pieces. One tool used since the early days was the car crusher. But only big automobile manufacturers could afford one. In the early 1970s, mechanically inclined yard workers began to build hydraulic crushers, which allowed the cars to be flattened for storage and transport. The owners were always looking for ways to improve business. An early obstacle was matching parts with prospective buyers. Resourceful auto wreckers realized by working together they could sell more. Speaker telephones, affectionately known as hoop, holler, and shout lines, connected many yards simultaneously. Uh, it was like the old telephone, except you had a speaker, and you would ask for a particular part and say, Spencer needs a, a transmission for a 55 Chevrolet. There might be 25 to 50, sometimes even up to 100 yards on this line. And if anyone had it, they would come back and say, I've got the transmission for $50. And everybody heard it. And some other man would come in and say, I got one for 45. The other guy said, I'll say you want for 45 laid in. For many early yard owners, keeping inventory was an exercise in brute memorization. Being able to find items in the yard quickly could be the difference between making or losing a sale. Forward-thinking wrecking yards were eager to implement new technology. In approximately 1980, we got our first computer. Our first computer was the size of a refrigerator. Today, the entire industry relies on computers. Thousands of yards communicate and share inventory via the Internet. Parts are shipped fluidly yard to yard across the country, nation to nation, all at the click of a mouse. Here's the newest wrinkle in auto salvage, the pick your part yard. Cars are placed on stands and the public is allowed to find and remove their own used parts. Tools in hand, the home mechanic is now the auto wrecking expert. This yard is divided into separate sections by product line, the Ford section, the truck section, uh, General Motors section, Chevy section, and imports. And the customers can come out and they go to a particular section if that's the type of vehicle that they're looking for. But before the cars reach the public lot, they're processed for both personal and environmental safety. Beginning at the arrival of the vehicle, when it comes to pick your part, it arrives at our drop-off area, removing the fluids, the license plates, and any trash from the car. And it goes to the oil rack, and they remove the existing fluids that aren't underneath the hood, for instance, that are accessible underneath the car. They remove the engine oil, transmission oil, rear end grease. Forklifts suspend the cars on metal racks. A special drill punctures the car's gas tank and siphons any remaining fuel. The fluids are collected in hoppers below the racks. 
Workers carefully remove the hazardous engine coolant and freon gas for proper disposal. While the oil, like almost everything else in the junkyard, will be saved for recycling. The process is quick. In as little as an hour, the car can join the nearly 2,300 other vehicles on display. Pick your part yards have become phenomenally successful. At this California yard, between 60 and 200 cars arrive every day. And on a busy Saturday, as many as 4,000 customers can be found pulling off fenders or prowling under the hood. There was a substantial amount of thought put into configuration of the yard here. Cars are aligned hood to hood and trunk to trunk to allow for an aisleway for the engine hoist to go through to make it easier for the customer to remove the engines. It also maximizes our space. The yard invests heavily in machines that keep the sprawling scrap under control. This is one gas tank. This is the condensed version of about 30 gas tanks. Condensing these gas tanks from a storage perspective works out to be a lot better for us and more efficient from a space perspective so that we can have a little more room to run other aspects of our operation. Even the cars on display aren't immune. The vehicles will stay in the yard for up to two months. When the time is up, the car is sold to a scrapyard regardless of how many parts have been removed. This policy keeps the inventory fresh, but it also means that the outgoing vehicles must be processed as quickly as the incoming. Some of the car parts are made from aluminum, which is more expensive and will fetch a higher price than the steel frame and body. The salvage yard dismantles or wrecks the car to separate the different types of metal. The first thing to go is the engine. And the Pick Your Part Yard has a special machine just for that purpose. This particular machine is one of two in existence. If an individual was to pull an engine out of the car, it might take him up to two hours to do that. This machine, however, take a matter of just a few seconds to yank an engine off of its engine mount. And just put it aside. Once the engine is removed, the giant claw effortlessly yanks any remaining... ...remaining valuable metal. The heater core and the AC condenser, also the radiator pulled, and the aluminum bumpers, because that has more value beyond just the scrap value of the flat car. The gutted vehicle is unceremoniously dropped into the compactor. It's crushed between 12 and 14 inches high as the roof slowly lowers on its helpless victim. When the process is finished, another car is added. Up to four will be smashed into one block of metal. The crushed car bodies are loaded onto flatbed trucks for shipping. The driver carefully inspects the load for loose pieces that may blow off during transport. For these cars, this truly is the end of the road. Their final destination is a scrapyard mill, where they'll be ground into pieces small enough to fit in your hand. But from there, the metal may turn up in any number of new products, even new automobiles. Which means one of these cars, in some small way, may find itself back on the road. Next, Americans find themselves knee-deep in their own trash, and junkyards are there to bail them out. The auto salvage business is the 16th largest industry in the United States, with over $5 billion in annual sales. Junkyards will return on Modern Marvels. Yes, personal computers have changed the world. But as we all know too well, the constant increase in speed and computing power makes machines obsolete almost as soon as they are built. The electronic junkyard is the byproduct of a technology evolving at light speed. You can recycle anything as long as you have enough of it. 
there are a lot of companies that are recycling computers. They still haven't gotten to a threshold level where everybody can say, well, when I finish with my computer, I'm going to take it over there and sell it to them. But that's quickly changing. Hundreds of thousands of outdated computers and other electronic equipment end up at places like this. United Recycling Industries in Chicago understands the machines may be obsolete, but they still have something to offer. The high-tech junkyard is a relatively new phenomenon. In the 1950s and 60s, few computers existed. But the ones that did were a treasure trove of precious metals. Gold connectors, silver wire insets, and copper circuit boards were the brains of these electronic thinking machines. You had a mainframe computer that would take up 15,000 square feet. By the time you throw in the CPUs, the generators, the coolers, and everything else, you're talking 20,000 square feet for something that had like 20 meg of memory. Back in the 60s and 70s, a ton of printed circuit boards probably had 30 to 40 ounces of gold. A good circuit board today is probably 8 to 9 ounces per ton of material. So while there is a lot of gold in this material, it's only there because you have so much volume. That volume is due in part to the personal computer revolution of the early 1980s. Driving this explosive market was the tiny integrated circuit. These chips were the power behind the marvelous machines. Unfortunately, many early scrappers continued to focus on the precious metals, never realizing the real money was in reselling the chips. Some brand new chips are worth hundreds of dollars, and the used ones can work just as well. You could have a board that had 25, 50 cents worth of gold and $2,000 worth of integrated circuits. It was mind-boggling. And we were just merrily going along our way trying to get, you know, your $300, $500 gold price at 9 ounces, 10 ounces per ton and throwing away $20,000 per ton in circuits. So in 1990, we got smart real fast. Today, electronic junkyards are more savvy. The machines that enter these recycling plants are picked clean. Nothing is taken for granted and nothing is wasted. The circuit boards behind me were all manually extracted out of electronics equipment. In this phase here is where we would remove the individual circuits themselves. These are almost like black gold. After this step, the printed circuit board is then sent on for precious metal recovery. Gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. Once everything of value is removed, the machines are sent to the crusher. Scrap equipment is loaded into the bin tipper, which is then dumped out onto the conveyor belt. That is loaded into a primary shredder, which is a 750 horsepower shear shredder. Material then is reduced down into four inch strips. A series of grinders further reduce the printers, copiers, and computers into pieces the size of a quarter. Shakers and sorters separate the material. The final stream of debris is sent across a device called an eddy current. The eddy current, a kind of magnet in reverse, charges the metal pieces and throws them from the conveyor belt. The metal leaps into a special bin while the remaining plastic rolls off. What was once thousands of dollars of digital might is transformed into pennies worth of plastic, glass and copper. All those pennies do add up, but the financial gain is only a small part of the electronic recycling equation. That's because relatively few computers are recycled, and the National Safety Council estimates that half a billion will be packed into American landfills between 1997 and 2007. Everybody in the government knows that the environmental problems from electronic scrap is a nightmare. Even the White House has somebody who is on electronic recycling on a committee for the president. Everybody knows this is a nightmare. If it hasn't already happened, it's right around the corner. And it's not the first time Americans have faced this kind of nightmare. Long before there was high-tech junk, there was low-tech trash. And it was packing landfills at an alarming rate. The problem led to recycling plants that specialize in rescuing reusable household materials before they reach the dump. Most people in our country you know, regard recycling as their disposal, but actually it's a large industry in the United States. The industry today is in excess of $20 billion, which is approximately half the size of the U.S. steel business. 
In 1970, the first Earth Day was held to draw attention to environmental problems. One of many concerns was overcrowded landfills. Recycling household products such as cans, bottles, and plastic containers seemed a simple solution. So, high-tech recycling plants were built. Some claimed the almost magical ability to take trash straight from the garbage truck and extract the recyclable goods. But many failed. The problem was most of these organizations were run by people who were highly motivated by the environment and didn't know the economics of scrap recycling. What we really have to understand is that this is a business and it's got to make money in order to survive. While private industry faltered, the government stepped in. Household recycling began in the mid to late 80s. Basically, due to legislation and lack of landfill space, the uh, cities were forced to get into the curbside or household recycling. Um, the programs primarily started with a dual stream program where the city would put one bin out for newspapers and one bin out for containers, which would be glass, steel, plastic, and aluminum. The dual stream system wasn't an overwhelming success. Perhaps it was too demanding for a partially committed public. By the early 1990s, single-stream recycling allowed people to throw everything into one bin. Single-stream was more user-friendly, and the public seemed willing to start recycling. In many places, the intake of goods doubled. Today, curbside recycling is more widespread than ever. The Allen Company is the repository for recycled materials collected in San Diego, California. Plant sorts and bundles used household paper, cans, and bottles. We get in about 180 tons of material every day. As you can see, the trucks dump the material in this big pile, and this is where the process starts. The material is put on the conveyor belt, and it goes up to the top of the pre start station. We have people that are picking off the trash and the cardboard, and then it goes on to the news screen. The paper surfs over the news screen's wheels, while the heavier material, like metal cans and plastic containers, fall between the cracks to a conveyor belt below. The process relies heavily on manual labor. As many as 40 hand pickers remove any material that slips through the separators. After all the materials are sorted and baled, they come out to our yard to be stored until we ship them either by rail or container. Every year, more than 200 billion pounds of used materials pass through recycling yards as a first step to becoming new products. And as more local governments mandate recycling programs, these yards may soon become the most numerous junkyards in the country. Next, when planes are too old for the wild blue yonder, they find a new home in the aviation boneyard. The energy saved from one recycled aluminum can will operate a television set for up to three hours. Junkyards will return on Modern Marvels. Airplanes. On any given day, nearly 60,000 will be winging their way across America, including over 30,000 jetliners some of the most technologically sophisticated machines ever created. Millions of individual components work together to keep these planes aloft. When they're no longer safe to fly, their last resting place is an aviation boneyard. Today, federal regulations and fear of lawsuits will keep many yard owners from reselling pieces off these planes. But that wasn't always the case. At one time, used parts were everywhere in the aircraft industry. Orville and Wilbur Wright may have been the very first aviation salvagers, often using pieces from one prototype aircraft to build another. Aviation boneyards grew with the industry. During World War I, the Curtis Company was one of the first to mass produce airplanes. The Jenny, as it was called, became an industry standard. And eventually, 
a boneyard regular. After the war, stunt flyers used these planes in traveling aerial circuses. Keeping them in the air meant finding parts. Most aviation salvage yards have started out from a need of parts. You know, somebody needed parts to build their airplane, so they bought another one for parts, and perhaps a second one after that. And first thing you know, you're in the parts business. <laughs> World War II saw the greatest buildup of aircraft in American history. From 1940 to 1945, nearly 300,000 planes flew out of homeland factories. After the war, some of these planes found work in the civilian world. Aviation boneyards provided parts for these converted trainers and crop dusters well into the 1970s. But over the years, the aviation salvage business changed. In the 1980s, many owners found themselves forced out. Not from low scrap or part prices, but from lawsuits. All the parts we sold, of course, were were good parts and, and had to be inspected to make sure they were good parts. But we might have sold a radio which worked fine and you put it in an airplane and a customer might have uh, years later flown into the side of a mountain in bad weather. We would get named in a lawsuit and we'd have to defend ourselves or pay. We never lost a lawsuit but we had to hire a lot of lawyers. And for this reason, a lot of us have gotten back out of the industry. Many remaining aviation junkyard owners looked for other ways to make a living off their flightless fleets. One company, the California-based Aviation Warehouse, found two unique business angles. Hollywood and food. Most people think that this is a salvage yard for the airline industry, and, and you can't sell uh, anything that's not documented to anything that's going to fly. So this is all just for mock-ups. Whenever a movie audience thrills to an exciting plane crash or sees an actor stare out of a helicopter window, they may be looking at a prop from this yard. And if the audience goes out to dinner after the movie, they may be eating in a prop from this yard. Over here I've got a scrapbook of some of the projects we've done, including uh, some of the airplane restaurants that we've sent overseas. This one is in Korea. In fact, all of these are in Korea. Movie props and theme restaurants. A niche industry. But in true junkyard fashion, this owner has found a way to make money off his second-hand planes. Managing the yard is a full-time job, and keeping track of everything can be a little daunting. We try to keep it organized. Uh, it gets moved around quite a bit, but yes, we have one section that's for helicopters, one that's for airliners, another section that's for uh, small planes, general aviation, a little bit of fighters and that sort. New acquisitions are always arriving. Today, three workers easily handle the task of offloading a Hughes 500 helicopter. But often the jobs are much bigger. What if a movie needs a jetliner? Or worse, half a jetliner? We have to cut it up small enough to get it on a truck when it leaves here. Basically what you'll use is like a chainsaw which has a uh, carbide blade on it, and you will cut the plane up. The only other option is to have the plane leave the yard in one piece. For aviation salvagers, this can be a heart and traffic stopping experience. Though great in the air, 747s don't do well on road trips. Still, this junkyard's ultimate service may be to the planes themselves. Aviation Warehouse boasts one of the largest collections of aircraft technical manuals in existence. Mechanics and airplane buffs alike regularly search the library. This junkyard owner hopes to keep these old-time flying treasures in the sky, if not through spare parts, then by providing knowledge instead. Next, a self-proclaimed doctor finds the secret to eternal life 
in his scrapyard. The U.S. Air Force runs one of the largest reclamation yards in the world. Its Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Center in Tucson, Arizona, stores nearly 4,600 aircraft on 2,600 acres of land. Junkyards will return on Modern Marvels. In the junkyard, nothing goes to waste. On the outskirts of Madison, Wisconsin, one old-time scrapper has found a unique way of sticking to that creed. Tom Every has been in the scrap business his entire life. I think that we all evolve, uh, and I recycled about every kind of thing there is. And then when I got all done, I realized, my gosh, there's nothing around even to look at. And so I decided in this uh, balanced part of my life, I would uh, build up instead of tear down. And that's what I'm doing, I guess. Building up has been Tom's passion for nearly 20 years. That's when he first stopped scrapping and assumed the mantle of his creative alter ego. A man he calls Dr. Evermore. The doctor's years of hard work and artistic vision have paid off in a creation dubbed the Forevertron. Built as an ode to immortality, the Forevertron's purpose is to launch the good doctor back into the heavens on a magnetic lightning force beam. And to do that takes a lot of stuff. The Forevertron is uh, about 130 foot long and about 65 feet high and uh, up to 120 foot wide. It weighs a, a little over 400 ton. As you may have guessed, the machine doesn't really work. But at one time, almost everything on it did. The Forevertron is a creative combination of artistic vision and gross tonnage, a metallic fantasy where art and history collide in some unexpected ways. Incorporated into the front of the artwork is part of the real-life decontamination chamber used by the Apollo astronauts after returning from the moon. In contrast, one of the oldest pieces is anything but space age. It's a 19th century bipolar dynamo from a very famous inventor. Right, big one is built by uh, Thomas Edison. It's the number four one that he ever built. Because the doctor is always finding new things, the Forevertron will never be finished. Like the piles in a scrapyard, it will simply continue to grow. I've saved big uh, copper brew kettles and candy pots and anything that had to do with copper and brass. I've got uh, mountains of it. I've got at least a, uh, a couple thousand ton of it laying around here. I'll never live long enough to use it all up, but I just love to see if there's anything that's got some uh, possibilities. And I thoroughly enjoy finding things and then putting them into something else again. With the heart of a scrapper and the eye of an artist, Dr. Evermore's vision isn't too far removed from that of every other junkyard worker. Well, maybe it's a little removed. But the truth is, this is an industry where one person's junk is another's masterpiece and where value and beauty are truly in the eye of the beholder.